Before we get started, I want to tell you about something new that we're trying. All podcasters know the best way to grow your show is through word of mouth. So we created a referral link that makes it easy to share the podcast by text, email, or DM to your friends, family, or anyone else you know who could use a little dose of inspiration for civic engagement and our collective future. It's a two-step process. First, follow the link in our show notes to get your personal referral link, which you can then send around. Once you share our show with five friends who then download the podcast, I'll send you a handwritten thank you note and a future hindsight button to thank you for your support. If you share it with 10 friends who download an episode, I'll send you a branded Future Hindsight Moleskin Notebook. Yep, a real Moleskin Notebook with our logo on it. Thank you for spreading the word and thank you for listening. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Leon Botstein. He's president of Bard College, chancellor of the Open Society University Network, and music director of the American Symphony Orchestra. With colleges and universities all over the country having to rethink how it's delivering education, we'll be going back to basics about how education should in fact serve our society. We discuss why democracy will only work when people have an open, critical mind, and therefore how crucially important it is to deliver high-quality education. The pandemic has sort of torn the mask off of the reality which we always knew was there, but were afraid to admit the near total bankruptcy of the American educational system. The assumption is that after finishing high school, the individual is prepared to take a place as a citizen and as a working individual in the society. But as it is now, and what COVID has shown is um, how poor it's been, our secondary system does not prepare our nation for citizenship and doesn't prepare them for the world of work. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. No, my pleasure. So I thought we would start with the basics as we're thinking about higher education today. What in your mind is the purpose of a university or of higher education in general? A university education, that is the schooling that people get after secondary schooling, is fundamentally voluntary. Once you're finished, you can do two things. That's the presumption. You can uh, get a job, uh, earn a living. And the second thing you can do is you can take your place as a citizen. Presumably, the education you've gotten is sufficient for you to participate in the uh, civic life or the political life of the country in which you're a resident. What this COVID crisis has revealed is something we already knew, I think, that in the United States in particular, the elementary and secondary system is very poor. It's particularly poor and inadequate for those who are poorest in the society. America has a reasonably democratic system, but one that has never found a way to reconcile excellence with equity. The assumption that if you finish secondary school, you can take your place as a citizen and get a job, that simply isn't true. The fact is our secondary system does not prepare our people to really act responsibly as citizens, and that cuts across race and class. We have a secondary system in which People graduate without knowing how a bill becomes a law. They have no understanding of the Constitution. They can't actually tell you very much about the history of the nation. So we have an unprepared citizenry that is barely literate. Now take the economic consequences of a poor secondary and elementary system. We have largely citizens, for the most part, who cannot really gainfully be employed without further education beyond high school. So... University education, which was once considered an option, a possibility, 
increasingly in the 21st century can't be viewed as an option or a luxury. In fact, to get a job, to keep a job, to stay employed in the modern economy, people will need skills and capacities that are not sufficiently developed by secondary schooling. So in your mind, what has COVID shown about the shortcomings in our education system today? The pandemic has sort of torn the mask off the reality which we always knew was there, but were afraid to admit, the near total bankruptcy of the American educational system. The assumption is that after finishing high school, the individual is prepared to take a place as a citizen and as a working individual in the society. But as it is now, and what COVID has shown is how poor it's been, Our secondary system does not prepare our nation for citizenship and doesn't prepare them for the world of work. Now, how do we know that? We know that particularly because in our circumstances, we have elected a government that has no respect at all for science, no respect for the rules of evidence, and very little respect for the rule of law and that it prides itself in its ignorance and prejudice and uh, flaunts it. The popularity of such a leadership reveals the bankruptcy of an education that was supposed to teach young people how to think, how the democracy theoretically works, understand what's in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, to also understand basic scientific literacy. Science is not infallible, but there's a clear line between truth and falsehood. So, for example, in the process of thinking about a vaccine, do we actually, as citizens, have people who understand how to calculate the risks of a vaccine? And is there a way not only to argue against them, but to convince, using language, other people of what the truth is and how to step away. So we don't provide an education that really results in responsible citizenship. It's not about political opinions. The issue is far more fundamental. We really haven't done a very good job in providing the necessary ingredient for a functioning democracy that protects freedom and actually upholds the values that we consider dear to our definition of America. On the economic front, the failure is even greater, that uh, high school education doesn't really qualify an individual for really gainful employment over a lifetime. That isn't the case anymore. So our current economy and the so-called third industrial revolution requires a level of education and skill far beyond what we're providing. So the COVID has rung a gigantic bell that keeps ringing that the educational system in this country has to be fundamentally reformed and improved, not tinkered with. And there are two pieces for that. One is the elementary and secondary piece, and the other is the higher education piece. In other parts of the world, the secondary education is presumed to be good enough that when you're finished with secondary school, high school, you then can choose a career. You should probably enter a university education the way we presume to do it under the label of the liberal arts. That is to say, you go to university, you go to college, and you don't decide immediately what you're going to major in. But what has happened in the last 50 years, at least, is that the high school education is no longer an adequate endpoint for education. That universal access to higher education now needs to be provided. I happen to think that the whole thing is much too long in duration that you could accomplish giving a universal college education to everyone if you cut at least two years out of the high schools and you ended high school after the 10th grade at 16 and started university education at 16. But Apart from creating greater efficiencies in the whole system, a college education now, probably a bachelor's degree, is probably the minimum standard 
in order to enable an individual to take a place in the economic system and clearly to take one's place in uh, the civil society and the political society that we can as citizens. So I have a bunch of questions now about everything that you said. In terms of contextualizing having a shorter secondary education, and you've been on the forefront with this, of course, with your Bard Early College Network, how do you envision the new liberal arts education? And in what way will it actually rectify the shortcomings in secondary schools and make for a more solid citizenry? First of all, I think the fault is in the creation of middle schools and junior high schools. I think that actually we should return to a much simpler system, an elementary and a secondary system. So high school would begin after the sixth grade and finish at the end of the 10th grade. The liberal arts needs to, they need to provide every student with a minimum set of skills and a knowledge base. Those skills and knowledge base can be said very simply. Number one, a familiarity with language, to be able to write and to read critically and travel through the Internet and be able to, through reading, distinguish what are good arguments as opposed to bad arguments, to look for evidence to support positions, in order to read critically and analytically. So the first is the command of language. Language is the instrument of politics. It's the instrument of democracy. Language is the core of what we aspire to as a civilized, law-abiding society. The second is that every student needs to come out of college with a serious mathematical and scientific and computational literacy. That means somebody has to come out, not only be able to plug in the machine, but actually program it, understand how it works, and adapt it to the uses they need. They have to be able to understand risks, probabilities, chances. They have to know the difference between uncertainty and risk. What is the basis for people asserting claims about climate change? Are they simply trying to sell you a set of prejudices, or is there some real evidence? And in order to evaluate that, one has to have some kind of scientific literacy. The third thing is one has to have some kind of ability to evaluate the way people tell the story of the past. The way we tell our history has a great influence on what we do now and what we'll do in the future. What are facts and what are fiction in history? So we debate uh, taking down monuments. Well, in order to decide what the right way forward is, one has to have some way to understand and evaluate the shifting ways and the different ways one can tell the story of the past. And one has to develop in the study of history the empathy. So in something as contentious as, for example, the creation of the American nation, Well, the fact is, for years we taught this story without a serious consideration of the history as told from the point of view of the indigenous population of the United States. It's a matter of how you would tell the story of the creation of the American nation from the point of view of an individual who is a member of the Iroquois, Mohican, or Cherokee, or Seneca nations. What would you think of the way you would tell this story if you actually had been transported from Africa? as a slave. So telling the historical account of the world we live in is something every college student in the liberal arts should learn. And then finally, in my view, people need to develop a sense of their own power as imaginative beings. And that is the creative part of the individual's soul. So the appreciation of things like poetry and literature and music and art and film and design, the aesthetic imagination, if you will. Uh, Those are the fundamental building blocks that um, provide for a good life and a productive life and a responsible life. And the liberal arts are a way to get every student, every citizen to explore and to acquire skills that um, then 
are the foundation for their deciding what they're going to do as a work life and also how they're going to spend their time, the values they're going to follow and live in a pluralistic society where people live side by side who are different. This week, Future Hindsight is presented by The Jordan Harbinger Show. As most of you know, Jordan is a podcast host himself and also the longest-running sponsor of our show. Jordan's podcast is one of the best interview shows available right now. So if you're in the mood for a fascinating conversation with someone at the top of their game, be sure to check it out. His style of interviewing brings listeners inside the minds of the most exciting people alive today – From athletes to scientists, from mob enforcers to FBI brass, he and his guests provide compelling stories and a rich collection of anecdotal information and lived experience. Jordan's show can help you think critically about the world or pass some time during lockdown. If you need inspiration or just a little pick-me-up, this podcast has you covered. If you like Future Hindsight, I think you'll enjoy The Jordan Harbinger Show, too. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find the show at jordanharbinger.com. So the Open Society Foundation has just endowed the Open Society University Network, and you have been named the chancellor of this university network. What is the vision of the Open Society University Network, and what is Bard's role in it? The idea behind the Open Society University Network is very simple. With technology, we have increasing capacities to improve access to higher education. So the Open Society University Network is a common platform of universities and colleges around the world that voluntarily decide to join a common distribution network where students in countries and places all over the world who normally wouldn't have access to a high quality education. So take an example. If you're a a particularly disadvantaged population, let's say in Europe, a member of the Roma, or you are a Rohingya in Myanmar, or you are a person in any nation where you're not in a privileged elite and you show the ability and willingness to get a higher education, both undergraduate and graduate. The Open Society University Network allows institutions all over the world to recruit and educate you using a free flow of students and faculty across borders and across institutional lines, a collaboration which opens up the possibility of education and shared resources to an otherwise excluded population. So it's also a way of innovating beyond the boundaries of institutional autonomy. Universities are a little bit comparable to uh, feudal kingdoms. Each has its own motto, its own history, its own tradition, and that's a good thing. But those barriers often make real collaboration almost impossible. And the 21st century is a time when those walls that separate one institution from another need to be opened up. You don't want to necessarily tear those walls down, but there's no reason why a person shouldn't be able to attend one institution and access resources at other institutions. I'm teaching a class, for example, in the Open Society University Network, and I have students from China, from Kazakhstan, from Ghana, from Europe, from Russia, and from the United States. That is one of the great advantages of the online modern technology of teaching. And eventually, some of those students in my class actually have spent part of their time on our campus, even though they're enrolled in a university in Russia or enrolled in a university in Europe. This is a kind of new vision of a common ground that's shared by independent institutions and where the sort of local tariff barriers between institutions are broken down. 
This is a perfect segue for a question on accessibility, because it sounds like this is essentially a higher level of accessibility for people everywhere, especially those who don't have access to going to a university, even in their own towns. But, you know, one of the things in the United States that people talk about all the time is that higher education is not accessible. And in your mind, is it because higher education, which is to say going to college, going to university, is so expensive? Or is it a different question about accessibility? So the issue about the expense of higher education is, I think, greatly misunderstood. It's expensive only because the society has made very poor decisions of how to fund it. So there are two problems with the accessibility of higher education as we understand it now. Number one, people are rightly annoyed because we have paid so little attention to the education from kindergarten or pre-K to the 12th grade, end of high school, let's say, that we've delayed getting the business done to the very end. So if you put college and elementary and secondary school together, you have 16 years of schooling. And we've sort of wasted the first 11 or 12 and then try to pack everything in the last four. And a high percentage of the population can't make it that far. They can't afford it. And suddenly, although we subsidize very effectively everything from K to 12, right? It's essentially free in public education. We stop doing that. Well, that's nonsense. The American nation needs to have a public higher education system which is affordable for every citizen. A university education is actually not expensive. It's actually a bargain. It's only not a bargain if you as an individual have to pay for it. The per capita cost of incarcerating a prisoner in a jail in the United States is higher than that of educating them in a school. So it's not the cost of delivering the service. It is the way we've decided to pay for it. And you're absolutely right. The access has been limited because we've passed the cost of higher education onto the consumer. We don't do that in secondary education. We don't do that in elementary education. And we need it for our own benefit. Education is not a giveaway. It's not an entitlement. All the statistics show that the more education you have, the higher your income. And if you have higher income, the government benefits because it has higher tax revenues and you're going to be employed at a higher paying job for a longer period of time. So it's an investment, it's a capital investment. It's the human infrastructure of a modern economy. And its access is limited because America has never decided in recent memory to fund higher education the way it should be funded. America fell in love with a myth that less government is good for you, which is a complete nonsense. No government is definitely not good for you. No government has shown us that we can't actually control our own lives in the pandemic. No government doesn't provide us the safety and security we require. So government is an essential instrument for providing education. That's why we pay taxes. But we should control what those taxes do. And among the things they need to do is to invest in free access. There was a time when the City University of New York was free to the people who got to the end of secondary schooling and merited going to a university. And that should be returned as an option. And um, so the access problem will be solved if the financing problem is solved. You raised some really good questions about the funding aspect. What do you hope that we as a society have the courage to do now during the pandemic or rather after the pandemic in terms of education in order to provide high quality education to all Americans? So I think several things need to be done. Number one, address the financing of public higher education by recapitalizing all the state universities in all of the states in the union. Every state university should be given a refinancing plan which has the effect of drastically reducing the tuition costs. 
There is no doubt that every individual should pay something to go to university, but it should be totally affordable and based on the ability to pay. So if I'm the child of a multi-billionaire, I get a big bill. If my family is destitute, and I'm qualified, I should pay nothing. Number two, the loan system that now exists has to be revised, and the existing student loans that are a huge drag on people's lives and the economy have to be refinanced and carefully eliminated. The system is bankrupt and should be declared bankrupt, and therefore all the liabilities should be set aside and a new rational system put in its place. So I would hope that the system would be reformed. The one thing I would hate to see in a post-pandemic circumstance is any kind of return to normalcy. There's no cause for nostalgia in American education here. This is a perfect opportunity to break the momentum of continuity. The other thing that a post-pandemic policy has to do is to incentivize becoming a teacher. America does not respect its teachers, doesn't pay them well, doesn't treat them well. So there's a lot to be done and actually know what needs doing. And the pandemic, in a way, is a fantastic opportunity to end business as usual. So as an everyday citizen, what are two things I could be doing to advance this future vision of education? The first thing to do as a citizen is express your interest in the quality of education. Stop thinking of education as a kind of government giveaway, but as an investment in the country and a necessary investment in the future of the country. The second is they need to lobby their governments to stop paying for schools by old tax methods, property tax, for example. Local school boards in elementary and secondary education are a great field of political engagement for local citizens. One of the last bastions of direct democracy is voting for your school board. And it seems to me that we need to somehow retain local control, but actually not uh, make every district or every even state responsible for its own financing. It's very important that the citizens really back a fundamental reform of the financing and governance of schools, and that there is also pressure on the states to relinquish the extensive over-regulation of the schools. The amount of bureaucratic and quasi-legal restrictions on the management and governance of schools makes it impossible to make any change. And the population has to actually try to simplify the bureaucratic regulatory framework in which we try to operate good schools. I think that's easier said than done. In order to understand these issues more deeply, I think it takes quite a lot of attention and also knowledge about what's possible. It takes a large dose of common sense. I think we are in a revolutionary moment. Revolution is a good word in American history. It brought us the current republic. We're in a time for radical change, but as you suggest, radical change that is actually informed by what the problem is and how to solve it. One of the positive things the trauma of the epidemic has shown is the inadequacy of our healthcare system and the inadequacy of our educational system. So I think the population would be prepared to listen to coherent, clear, simple, and straightforward plan to radically improve and change the situation and turn a new leaf. Agreed, 100%. Last question. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? I'm very hopeful that a coalition can be built that is about compromise and working together with a very quick and decisive agenda to address the major issues that face us, and education is among them. 
education and democracy are inextricably linked. And we haven't totally honored that link. Democracy will work only with people with an open critical mind. It will only work if people are tolerant of people who are different and respect those differences and also find a common ground between them. And it will only work if we learn how to compromise, negotiate, decide, and to deal with one another with civility and not with violence. I'm hopeful because we have a chance actually to realize the promise of democracy and freedom. Our problem is not that we cherish freedom, quite the opposite. Our problem is that we not only take it for granted, but we don't utilize it. And we don't utilize our rights. And in fact, we might be happier if we could blame somebody else, a tyrant. We are more than willing to become victims and to throw up our hands and not roll up our sleeves, so to speak, to make the world a better place. And because we feel so powerless, understandably, we give up. And when we give up, we sound the uh, death knell, if you will, of democracy. And this is a moment, my hope is that people around the world will not give up hope and that they won't actually use democracy to undo itself. So I'm hopeful that people will cherish democracy and freedom. We have to find a way forward that somehow gives room for a reconciliation of freedom and fairness. Yes, agreed. Thank you very much for being on Future Hindsight, and thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. Though, of course, it's totally obvious that a healthy democracy relies on a well-educated, literate citizenry that is able to think critically and engage in public discourse, it isn't often that we say that part out loud. And it isn't often that we have an opportunity like the present, of education as we know it having been upended, to actually make change. I know it seems that we have more urgent business between mass evictions and a tanking economy, rolling out the COVID vaccine and ending the pandemic. But if we don't act now to start delivering high quality education, we're sure to lose our democracy. It may seem unlikely, but perhaps the best place to start is to declare student loans bankrupt and to start anew. And finally, to recommit to providing affordable public university education, considering that it's more expensive to incarcerate someone than to educate someone. It's a no-brainer investment in our future. Next week, our guest is Ted Dintersmith. He's the author of What School Could Be and is on a mission to help equip our children with skill sets and mindsets that are essential in a world of innovation. We discuss how to set the conditions for great learning and why the opportunity to reform high schools is now. A lot can happen locally without anything federally. And so I would say to schools listening, do not wait for the Secretary of Education or the State Commissioner of Education to give you permission to do what you need to do. You have a great opportunity right now to do the most amazing things. Nobody's looking over your shoulder. The state mandated exams, they're meaningless now. The curriculum police are off the job. Even colleges are dumping the SAT and ACT, which I think is healthy. There are great circumstances in place right now for schools to be bold about what they do. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for continuing to listen to Future Hindsight. Our executive producer is Mila Atmos. The audio producer is Peter Fedak. And our associate producers are Miriam Zumbul and Brooke Sion. Be sure to listen to us on Apple Podcasts, futurehindsight.com, or wherever you enjoy podcasts every week. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.